to talk about a study that I was involved with uh, by the National Research Council. And the name of the study was The Hydrogen Economy, Opportunities, Cost Barriers, and R&D Needs. And I want to talk about hydrogen first. And let me just say a couple things about hydrogen. The vision of hydrogen is energy security and a cleaner environment, particularly reduced CO2 emissions. And uh, but by no means is this the only way to accomplish this. And it's certainly a major part of the Bush Energy Plan. And this study was commissioned by the Department of Energy and the Academy basically looked at the Bush Energy Plan and its, the DOE's R&D program in 2002. And uh, it took us about 18 months to do this uh, through a National Research Council effort. There were 16 of us, and I'll show you. And we use the National Research Council protocols. The report was issued in, in 2004, and then it, there had been a, a subsequent study. And obviously, we all know that energy prices have changed a lot since 2004, and we have updated our economics as it was to show you for current energy prices, because economics play a, a big role in this. I just want to tell you, for those of you, most of you are familiar, but what is the National Research Council? The National Academy of Sciences was uh, commissioned by President uh, Lincoln in 1863, and in the mid 
1950s, early 60s, the National Academy of Engineering was formed and the National the, the Institute of Medicine, which collectively are called the academies today. The operating arm of the academies is the National Research Council. And the National Research Council is an independent organization that's funded uh, a lot by government, but also by independent, by foundations. It has its own $400 million endowment. We do independent studies in Washington, all by volunteers, uh, to look at the issues of national importance. And uh, DOE asked us to look at the hydrogen economy. Uh, there are actually three of, uh, almost 300 studies a year done in the National Research Council with 6,000 volunteers uh, that spend time putting these kind of studies together. This is just one of those studies. Obviously, it's, uh, it has a lot of attention because there's so much hydrogen without putting it from the uh, paper. Uh, one of the important things about this study is it made 46 recommendations to the Department of Energy, on, particularly on their R&D program. Uh, within six months, they had implemented 40 of them, which is almost unheard of uh, for uh, uh, major changes. And the, uh, the, pro the program continues to evolve, and I'm going to go through the recommendations. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the energy issue. I'm going to show you what the study tried to accomplish. I'm going to show you some of the results and the recommendations. And out of this, I, want, I hope that you can glean what's really important and what are the issues about hydrogen as a fuel in this, in this country. Two things I want to tell you. The first is that when you look at hydrogen as a fuel, uh, we chose to actually look only in light duty transportation because the committee's feeling was if hydrogen cannot be a source for light fuel transportation to, to uh, reduce petroleum input, it actually will never be able to penetrate the market. And the second is that as we look at renewable energy, which I am going to discuss, hydrogen is a commodity. It has to be a commodity to be a fuel. And electricity is a fuel. <coughs> And so I'll tell you more about that later, but it's a very important part of these, these conclusions. I'm going to have to step back here at the time to advance this. Uh, just to show you, this is the committee, a uh, 16 person committee that worked on this, and you'll, I don't want to go through all these names, but you'll see these committees are consensus committees. And you'll see there's people from a lot of different, the Bill Powers was the Vice President of Research for Ford. We have people from the National Resources Defense Council, uh, a lot of different backgrounds. Jim Sweeney is a world-class economist. In fact, he got called to the White House in the middle of one of our studies. And that night he was on TV sitting next to Bush because uh, we did a lot of economic studies in this whole outfit. In these types of studies, for those who aren't familiar, this committee has to basically draw consensus on all the conclusions, which after years in management is an entirely different kind of process to get all these people to agree uh, to these kind of recommendations. And so we spent a lot of time together. First, let me talk just a little bit about energy in the US and the world. Um, this is stuff you probably all know, but I want to expand on it. Global energy consumption from an uh, oil standpoint is over 80 million barrels a day today, which is 30 billion barrels a year. I can tell you ExxonMobil just gets excited if we find a billion barrel field. The world is today consuming 32 billion barrels a year of oil. And uh, the U.S. consumes about 25% of it, and about 60% of it's imported. And if you look at 2015, 2020 world consumption, will probably be up in the neighborhood of 120 million barrels a day of oil. And so not only is the consumption rapidly increasing, primarily because of the third world, this country of ours is a massive consumer of oil, mainly for light duty transportation. And uh, you can see we, we consume 25% of the oil and the imports will only go up. One of the misconceptions is, and it probably comes out in a lot of the press, is if you look today, most of the oil that we import is not from OPEC. In fact, a lot of it's from North America. Of course, Venezuela is a little unstable. Uh, maybe a little is an understatement. But obviously, 
most of the oil in the world still remains in, in Saudi Arabia. So the appetite for oil and its relationship to our energy security, as you all know, is obviously a major issue and finding domestic sources for that is, is obviously very, very important. <coughs> now, the other part of this I told you about was carbon dioxide emissions, which is a little different measure. Um, if you look at this, this is domestic. Well, one thing I want to mention to you, when you do a study for the Department of Energy, you look at U.S. issues, uh, these are really global issues. And so one of the real failings of the study, and there's some stuff going on with the UN to start looking at this more of a global. These are global issues. They're not just US issues. US policy can affect US issues, but these are these are global potential problems. And this in the US in 1990, what's let me stand over here. If you, first of all, these are the CO2 emissions on a on a carbon basis. Uh, from the from the U.S., the first thing I want you to notice is that they're they're rapidly increasing. And if you look at the number, the number is here uh, in, in 2000, where we are right now. There's almost uh, a billion and a half tons of carbon put out in the atmosphere of this country every year. And in the world, there's 6.6 .6 billion tons of carbon put in the atmosphere every year. So the question in this study, in light duty transportation, if you address it with hydrogen, will hydrogen have a major impact on reducing that? And you get somewhat of a feel from that if you just look at, let's just look at 2025, it doesn't matter. Just look at these bars, okay? This is the major source of carbon dioxide in the U.S. Uh, third from petroleum, a little more than a third from petroleum. Uh, natural gas and coal. Coal is a high carbon emitter. And if you look at the industrial sectors, you'll see that this piece is transportation. And about a third of all the carbon dioxide is emitted in the U.S. is from transportation, which says most of the carbon dioxide is emitted from someplace else. And most of it is a problem of power generation, and particularly power generation from coal. And uh, so it, it uh, but it, it's a growing problem, and, and obviously if this is an issue that's not addressed in the long term. Uh, uh, we're going to have global warming and all types of other things. Now, I'll give you an example the Let me just talk a little bit about how to make hydrogen. And uh, it, it's a very important issue. When I talk about, in this talk, uh, when I talk about hydrogen, I'm talking about the production of hydrogen, the distribution of hydrogen, and the use of hydrogen. And the use of hydrogen that's being addressed here is used in fuel cells, and primarily in fuel cells that are used in automobiles. Uh, and that is the combined, there's a term that we use which is well to wheels. So we'll look at well to wheel energy use from the production of the hydrogen all the way through to it powering your vehicles. So in a study like this, we need to look at the issues relative to making the hydrogen, dispensing the hydrogen, and then the vehicle itself of using the hydrogen. But this is, this is, the, this is the manufacturer of hydrogen. And you can see you can make hydrogen, and, and from a, it can be a secure energy source, it needs to be domestically produced. You can make it from coal, we have as much coal and energy as, as the Saudis have in oil. You make them natural gas. You can make uh, natural gas and coal. You can make hydrogen directly. You can make it from nuclear heat. And particularly the new, what are called the Gen 4 nuclear reactors, which actually are generating and operating above almost 1,000 degrees C. That heat, which is a spinoff from those react reaction can actually be used in a number of different ways to generate hydrogen. And the DOE has programs to actually look at that. Then you can use the primary energy through electricity. You can make all these, all these types of things to make electricity. You know, electrolyzer with water, where you actually basically uh, take the electric power, you, you electrolyze uh, an electrolyzer with water, and you get hydrogen and CO2, and then you can use solar PV, wind, and biomass, biomass directly. So you can make hydrogen in all those ways and they can all be domestic sources. 
The question is, which is obvious, what's the cost? What's the status of the technology? And can it ever be good enough? And will it both affect be able to make hydrogen cost the bed fleet and you'll be able to make it with the kind of energy efficiencies that are required. Because uh, if you take more, you know, if you take more energy to drive your vehicles by making hydrogen than you're with oil, you're working backwards. So you need to have very energy efficient systems. Thank you. Now let me go into the study and uh, this is what the team focused on. And then I'm going to show you some results. Uh, we assess the current and future technologies for hydrogen production and use. Those types of technologies I showed. So what is the status of those technologies? And something that a lot of these studies don't do, we try to project ahead of how good can the technology get. How good can PV be? Can, can uh, photovoltaic solar ever be cheap enough and efficient enough to generate hydrogen as a commodity? That's, that's a question. So we not only looked at the current state of the technology, we looked forward at the technology. We estimated the current and the future costs, the CO2 emissions, and the energy efficiencies. And again, it's very important to look at energy efficiencies because if you look at the debate, I should mention this in Iowa, if you look at the debate over ethanol, and the people, and I don't have an opinion on this, but the people who believe that ethanol takes more energy to produce than you get out of it, it might help CO2 but you might be going backwards. I don't know if that's right or not. But this is the same kind of issue here. If you take more energy to make the hydrogen get out of it, then you're really going backwards. So you really have to look at energy efficiencies. We did this. Uh, then we developed scenarios for the future light duty vehicles. And light duty vehicles are SUVs and down. Uh, and associated impacts on oil import. And we, we, uh, we actually estimate out 50 years and I'll show you some of those What we thought the world would look like in the best hydrogen world you could live in. And maybe the best <coughs> hydrogen world you could live in. Both from a cost standpoint and also how fast can, can it can penetrate the market. And then we, get, we addressed inter infrastructure issues. And let me just tell you that one of the most important parts of this study is we address the infrastructure issues. Because hydrogen is made today. Every, almost every refinery makes hydrogen. You can't quite make it at these costs, but you, you're going to see some numbers. You can certainly make it from methane pretty cost effectively. But the problem is getting hydrogen from here to there. You know, in the middle of the study, my wife and I were in New York for a weekend, and I went up and took a walk. I'm walking around, and I said, oh, my God, someday somebody's going to build all these hydrogen pipelines through New York City to fuel their hydrogen vehicles. And how is that going to happen? But there's a real chicken and egg argument. Because you know, companies who build those things aren't going to invest until there are enough vehicles to consume them. And the people who want to build the vehicles aren't going to build until the hydrogen's there. So they all blame each other, right? <coughs> and so it's a real significant issue. And then we reviewed the R&D plan for hydrogen uh, and production and use. We reviewed the fuel cell programs. And we re recommended changes <coughs> to the Department of Energy. Yeah, next slide, thank you. Now, I think important in this is, is not next, next, just next. <laughs> next square. Um, one of the things we did early in this study is, there, you know, there's a lot of talk about using, I'm going to show a fuel cell in just a second. You know, seen, but, you know uh, 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 people talk about using fuel cells in, and calculate or hydrogen and fuel cells and calculators and all these things. And people talk about uh, wind energy, which I'm actually a real fan of. But, you know, is the quantity of these energy really enough to substantially reduce our demand on imported oil? The volume of oil we use is unbelievable. You know, if, if the world consumes 20 billion barrels a year of oil, We consume 10 billion barrels a year of oil. And so to reduce that number, you need big things. And so we looked at technologies that could significantly impact. So we picked big things, uh, both, both energy security and CO2 emission. 
And we worried about the time scale. Can all this happen? You know, there's people out that say there are going to be hydrogen vehicles in the market in 10 years. Uh, are those vehicles enough to really penetrate the market? So you really have a lot of vehicles on the market? Or are you going to have a few vehicles on the market? How long does it take to get enough hydrogen vehicles into the market to have a significant impact on our energy security? Time scale is important. Another reason it's important is it's important in the R&D program. Because if you have a short-term time frame, you might focus your work on development activities. But if it's a long-term and you have significant issues in some parts of the technology, you might need to go back and do more exploratory research. So the time frame becomes an important aspect of this. And then there's the social and political issues that could really slow up the implementation. Oh, there's a technology, and I want to talk more about this, but we also looked at the technology developments needed for the steady state. This is when you get 300 million hydrogen vehicles out there, and how do you provide it? And, enough hydrogen, and, and, and also, how do you get hydrogen? How do you get through this transition, this chicken egg argument? What are the, is that a different set of technologies that you need to do that? So we, we looked at that. We worried a lot about the social and political issues, and I'll talk a little bit about policy later. Uh, but particularly one of the social issues is safety. Because everybody who's anti-hydrogen will tell you it's not safe. And you know, we got so many we got so many people wrote us letters in this during this study telling us that hydrogen is not safe. And uh, there's obviously major safety issues with hydrogen, but I can tell you that hydrogen is a big industry in this country. It's handled all the time. It's handled all the time in the world with very few incidents. But you know what the safety problem is? Is when Mike Rangish has to fill up his own car at the hydrogen filling station. And you put the human consumer at the interface of hydrogen. And then it becomes an issue. And so there's social issues, there are perceived issues, and there are real issues around hydrogen. And then what's, D what's DOE's real role in all of this? Because, you know, DOE's not going to make these vehicles. GM's going to make them. Toyota's going to make them. Some people are making them now. So what is DOE's role? Because one thing we found out, DOE didn't, DOE didn't quite know its role. It was doing things that we didn't think they should be doing, that GM should be doing. And so that's you know, now the next one. Now, let me just talk a little bit about hydrogen fuel cell. I mean, hydrogen fuel cell is a battery. And I want to use this slide to illustrate some of the issues relative to the fuel cell. Because this is the number one problem in the hydrogen economy, is the fuel cell. The number two is, is developing infrastructure. But a hydrogen fuel cell basically works like a battery. Hydrogen goes in, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's oxidized at the anode. Uh, the proton goes across a membrane, solid polymer, uh, to the cathode. And, uh, and there are reactions with oxygen and water is given off. And you get the electricity flow in the loop. And fuel cells have been around a long, long time like this. And so the question is, what is new? And to make this work uh, in a power plant is one issue, like the, uh, you know, the stationary power, to make it work in your car, OK, at 80 degrees centigrade and last 5,000 hours and not have the cost change of your car is an entirely different issue. And what has happened in this, and it actually was happening all the time we were working on this project. We started this project for this. Now this, let me just, probably everybody knows this, but I mean, this is basically a car running on a battery. That's what it is. It's just a battery that operates with hydrogen and oxygen, water, air, hydrogen and air. And uh, now, what is required to do this? First of all, it has to fit in the car, and the consumer and I guess I've become convinced of this, the consumer wants the same car. I mean, they don't want to, you know, you, you can't take a lot more space up. So the issues with the fuel cell <coughs> are the cost. When we started this project, the target price is, if you put it in kilowatt term, was about $35 a kilowatt. And we're storing hydrogen on board the vehicle, which is another massive problem. It's about $50 a kilowatt. So that's the cost target. The cost was $2,000 a kilowatt. That's where, that's where the motor companies were in 2002. 
$2,000 a kilowatt, not $50 a kilowatt. And the durability of these systems, primarily because the, the electrolyte here, which is the membrane, solid liquid, is very, is, is very sensitive to temperature and water. The durability was less than 1,000 hours, and really the durability has to be over 5,000 hours because you don't want to go buy one of these things for your car. You know, they were, they were frequently. What has happened is, in the last four years, the price has come down. The, the, uh, I just, there's another study, which I'm not going to talk about, that I just finished working on, which is a vehicle program in Detroit. And we believe now the cost is probably down to $300 to $250 a kilowatt, with the target of $50 a kilowatt. And the durability is up. But there's still a long way to go. And the reason I say this is the number one issue in the hydrogen economy, particularly the hydrogen economy, on the transportation side, because if the fuel cell doesn't work, there's no hydrogen economy. It has to work. Make all the hydrogen you want, but you've got to have a fuel cell. The other issue with the fuel cell is it has to be highly efficient. Because when you make hydrogen, if, if you actually, if you're in a refinery and you make uh, gasoline, from the point that you have the oil to the point the gasoline is made and put in the car, you only lose about 15% of the energy. If you're making hydrogen in the best cases, you're going to lose half of the energy. But when you run an internal combustion engine with gasoline, you lose 70% of the energy. Very inefficient energy. A fuel cell is very efficient. So the, this has to make up the energy. So you go lose more when you make the hydrogen, but this has to be very efficient. In fact, it has to be 6% efficient. It's another key point of this. And I guess in the end, I'm going to show you, we believe it can be that efficient. So those are the issues, the durability and the cost, that a lot of progress is being made. And I guess when people ask me this question, I know that GM and Ford has been billions of dollars of research in fuel cells. And I just don't believe that they would spend that kind of money. And I'm sure they know things we don't know when we're looking at this. But they're spending a lot of money. So I believe that a lot of progress is being made, but it's still the number one issue. Now let me talk about hydrogen generation. Uh, uh, I'm going to show you some cases, but really there are three different cases that you can make hydrogen. One is a large central hydrogen plant, like a refinery. And, in our, and, our, and we study, we, we actually assume there was a large, in one case called central station, I'm going to show you some slides of these terms, a large hydrogen plant, 1.2 million kilograms a day. A kilogram of hydrogen by happenstance, has about the same energy content as a gallon of gasoline. So all these things that are kilogram, you can really think of as gallons of gasoline. So at 1.2 million kilograms today of hydrogen, you have four huge pipelines that would go into a city like Los Angeles, and that plant could, could service about, provide hydrogen for about uh, over 2 million cars. For example, there's 10 million cars in Los Angeles, so you would need you would need five to six plants this size to provide the hydrogen for all the cars in Los Angeles. This is 10 times larger than any hydrogen plant ever been built that we assumed in this. We assumed it could be scaled up and we would get economics of scale. The other thing is this is one-tenth of the size of the largest refinery built in the U.S. So even with these large plants, you would need a lot of them to provide. And I'm going to show, you're going to see that actually the economics of these large plants, particularly from coal and natural gas, uh, are pretty reasonable. Um, Mid-sized plant uh, would, would service about 4,000 gallons of car. And I'm going to show you this is the only size plant you could use for a biomass refinery. And that's why we have this size, because the acreage required to grow switchgrass is what we, what we assume here. Uh, which was a 100 square mile plant, would make enough hydrogen to feed this size plant. But you obviously would need a lot of these plants. And then distributing, which I'm going to talk a lot about, but this is basically you put in your hydrogen generation right at your filling station. And you either bring water and electricity into the filling station, or you bring natural gas into the filling station, generate hydrogen on site. And that way, this is 500 gallons, kilograms a day. And it could, it could provide uh, basically hydrogen for, for 850 cars. 
So that's doing it on site. Three different sites. It's very important, particularly in the transition discussion. Now, let me show you some cost. A lot of stuff on this slide. Uh, I'm going to just give you some trends here. This is the large plants, natural gas, coal, and nuclear. Uh, we, have, we have the current technology, and we have as good as the technology can get. This is gasoline, $2 a gallon, or a little more. No, no taxes here. Okay, this is sort of the DOE goal of cost. The first thing you notice here, in these large central plants, whether you make them natural gas, coal, I'll tell you sequestration is like <coughs> nuclear, it's all the cost isn't really the issue. I, I don't have it on this chart, but one thing that's different than the gasoline, all of this cost is basically in the refinery. Half of these costs are infrastructure costs to deliver. So you shift the cost from the, from the plant to the pipelines and everything to get the hydrogen. Because you can visualize what you have. Is you have a hydrogen plant, and you've got to move the hydrogen <coughs> through some kind of pipeline or something to get it to the end use so you can fill it up in your car. The, the mid-sized plant, which is biomass <coughs> sequestration, uh, a lot of you, I'm sure, know this, but sequestration is a process that's getting a lot of attention in Washington. That's where basically a coal plant or a natural gas plant, you basically capture the carbon dioxide of the tail of the plant, you ship it, and you put it underground to use gas reservoirs or save the aquifers or something. And uh, so these plants have with sequestration in them. And obviously you handle the CO2 that way. You don't have any CO2 from these plants, or very little CO2. Then you have the small plants, the distributed plants, natural gas, electrolysis, and wind. And the small natural gas plants uh, look like they can be cost competitive, uh, close to cost competitive with gasoline. So what do we conclude from this? <coughs> well, first of all, we conclude that central plants cost isn't the issue. But the infrastructure piece of the cost is large, and the infrastructure <coughs> piece of this whole puzzle, again, I don't have it on there. Uh, biomass is not cost competitive. And even in the future biomass cases here, we assume that uh, I don't know, the, 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 the yield per acre on switchgrass was up 50% and gasification efficiency will increase 50%. And we did all these calculations, by the way. We had models and all this kind of stuff. Biomass in this form is not a thing. But distributed natural gas could be close if enough research was going on it. And the PV, solar energy, in the form that it's done today, which is polar take thin film, and we had we got we had uh, 20 experts that came in and talked to us about these technologies, and then we did these calculations. Solar energy will never be energy efficient enough, uh, or cost competitive enough to make hydrogen from, because so because PV makes electricity, and electricity is a premium fuel. You turn around and take that electricity. When you, with electricity, if you go through an electrolyzer, like I showed you before, you electrolyze water, you really run backwards. But anyway, the economics say that uh, these large central plants and probably the natural gas distributed plant can be close to being economic. So the whole issue of people saying you can't do this because of cost is probably, from our study, says this is not the right part. Of it. The infrastructure costs in here are the right. Okay, next slide. <coughs> Now, the, other, the next slide is energy efficiency, and I'm sure some of you haven't used, used to see these kind of slides, but this is the energy use, forget the term, this is energy use per kilo, kilo, kilometer and uh, kilometer. And uh, what's really important here, this is like miles per gallon. So this, if you just took this as miles per gallon, and this is gasoline, you can see how energy inefficient it is. Because of the Assume what we believe that the efficient energy system of fuel cell can be. That all of these areas here become more energy efficient, even with current technology and future technology and the current engines. And when it's more energy efficient, you're going to generate less carbon dioxide than you do with internal combustion engine today. Uh, uh, and even in these, nat in these natural gas, uh, 
become more energy efficient. So it became a very, I'm going to show you some plots of what this looks like in energy security. But it's a very important parameter here that this all is driven by what we believe the energy efficiency of the fuel cell could be and how tight we can make the manufacturing process on the hydrogen. Next slide, please. Now, time. I talked about time. We need a time frame. What I plotted here, and I'll tell you how I got it, is this is penetration of vehicles. And, and uh, I don't have a, this is what the committee called their optimally plausible, this is as good as we think it could be. I'll tell you how we did this second. But this is assuming hydrogen vehicle penetration, which means that, they're, that they are, uh, there's hydrogen available, and it assumes that the vehicles themselves are cost competitively and energy efficient and durable and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we first took hybrids. These are gasoline hybrids, and we looked at the penetration rate for gasoline hybrids. Uh, this is conventional vehicles, and this is the penetration rate for hydrogen vehicles. And how we did this is we looked at the history of a number of new vehicle penetrations into the world economy. The first we looked was at uh, front wheel drive cars, and the second we looked at the history of hybrids. And what we concluded was that in those vehicle changes, the market penetration from the point that the uh, vehicles were uh, commercial was 1% a year. And actually, with all this hype about hy hybrids, and this good stuff that's going on about hybrids, which I like, it's still 1% a year. So, you know, and, and so what happens is with hybrids, the time they get the, the initial penetration in commercial, you have about 10% penetration after 10 years. You gotta remember there's a lot of cars out there. There's 200 million vehicles in the US today, and the projections are there'll be 500 million vehicles by 2050, and uh, a lot of vehicles. So this is what we call the optimally plausible, and we did the same thing for hydrogen then. So a hydrogen then, there's, if it can be the same as hybrids and front wheel drive, that's as good as it can get. Because <coughs> hydrogen requires an infrastructure change for those other ones don't. So we came up with this hydrogen penetration curve. The optimally plausible, in fact this plot was in the New York Times. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure this is a lot different than DOE, but it certainly got some attention. Turn the page, or next one please. This, this leads to a, uh, uh, a hydrogen penetration curve of how fast hydrogen can <coughs> penetrate the U.S. market. In the best case possible, assuming the technology is available, the fuel cell is right, infrastructure is right, and what this tells you is that it's going to be 2035, you'd have 40% penetration, uh, and it's, you know, you, uh, it'll be 2050. To show you the, uh, the amount of, this is uh, billions of kilograms per year of hydrogen, the U.S. Production of hydrogen today is right here. And so there's a tremendous amount. For example, to generate all of this hydrogen, you'd have to build 70 world class coal plants at $250 billion, and the maximum you probably can build is five a year because of people issues, you know, permitting issues. So there's a massive infrastructure development issue just to be able to bring this on the street. Uh, now, will this have an effect? Let's turn to the next slide. This is our projection of impact on energy security. And let me just give some numbers here. What this is, is uh, This is uh, billions of barrels. This is uh, imp this is imported oil. This is conventional. Um, I just replot it. Yeah, but the number is too small. Oh, 
Oh, this is right. No, this is right. This, this, is, this is the total amount of oil that's used in light duty transportation. This is, you know, if you look at this, it's 8 billion barrels a day. Uh, 2005, it's 10, 9 billion barrels a day in light duty transportation. Uh, we're totally using about 20 million barrels a day of oil. This is the amount that's used in light duty transportation. There's another fraction here that's used in, in, uh, in trucking and used in uh, the air, aircraft industry and so forth. And this is, so this is the amount of oil projected with conventional vehicles. And by the way, one thing I didn't tell you is, we assumed that vehicles would get better with time. And so while the conventional vehicle today is 20 miles a gallon, that by 2050, it would be 35 miles a gallon. We assumed that the, when the first hydrogen vehicles came in, they'd be at 50 miles a gallon, growing to 80. But this is a learning curve. And the same thing with the hydrogen, hybrid vehicles. This is if you have all hybrids. And this is you go to hydrogen. Now, I'm messing up this chart. Let me just tell you what's important here. Is obviously you're in 2050, you're 16 million barrels a day, 15 million barrels a day of oil to provide your transportation. If you do hydrogen in 2050, you would save 15 million barrels a day of oil. Okay? But if you take the projections of DOE, by 2050, we'll be importing 30 million barrels a day of oil. Today, we're importing about 12 million barrels a day to meet, to meet demand. So what this tells us is that hydrogen can play a major role in reducing imports, but it can probably only play a role in reducing half of the imports. Doesn't mean it's not important to work on. I'll probably screw this slide up about it. Let me just say it again. 2050, importing 30 million barrels a day of oil, consuming something like 40 million barrels a day of oil, the world has that much oil, okay? Hydrogen can replace half of them, so half of those imports. So there's still a massive import. So it can play a major energy, but it's not the only solution. And if you look at our report, the first recommendation in this report is somebody has to look at something besides hydrogen. It's an important issue. But it cannot solve the total. And actually, the new Bush Energy Plan is actually more robust on the broad scale than this is. So anyway, so we project it out, and it can have a, ma a major impact. And you can see the impact hybrid. With all the talk about hybrids and energy security, the impact on, on um, is 6 million, 7 million barrels a day with hybrids. Because they just don't have the efficiency that I still sell them. Next slide, please. Now, I have two, three more slides. Um, what are the implications from this study? For the Let me just mention CO2, which I didn't show. We, we have plots like that for CO2. And I didn't show them here, because one of the things I showed you was that the major issue in CO2 is not vehicles. It is power generation, because most of it is generated in power plants. And while uh, you could show these slides with, uh, also you could basically get rid of all the CO2. It would have much more, much less of an impact if you only address the CO2 problem of transportation. It would, it would by transport. Now what are, the, what are the implications for the national goals? Uh, a hydrogen, hydrogen fundamentally transform the U.S. energy system. Uh, and our committee felt strong that a robust ongoing hydrogen program is important. And, but it needs to be important as part of a larger energy program, which also looks at electric cars, for example, batteries. You know, a DOE almost quit working on batteries. The last study I was working on, there's only $10 million a year being spent on, on advanced battery technology for all plug-in types of vehicles. And uh, a lot more, you know, uh, batteries have the same kind of uh, technical hurdles that fuel cells have. Uh, the the uh, hurdles to a hydrogen economy are more than technical and economic. They're also social and political. Natural gas as a hydrogen source is a significant energy issue because you, know, you can make hydrogen very efficiently from natural gas. In fact, our study recommended that DOE stop working on any hydrogen, large central plant hydrogen natural gas. 
because natural gas, we're importing about 10% today. And any of you who live on, along the coast know that getting a, uh, an LNG uh, terminal permitted near somebody's house is almost, is, is almost impossible. And by, by 2015 or so, uh, we're going to be importing about 15% of natural gas, and most of it comes from the same unstable parts of the world as oil. Uh, the R&D can particularly overcome the technical and economic hurdles, uh, but maybe not by implication all of the social political terminals with building infrastructure and so forth. And the U.S. must, remi must uh, maintain a robust, balanced energy program in areas other than hydrogen. Next slide, please. In this study, then we address the transition. If you remember the hydrogen curve, which looks like this S-shaped curve, and you realize that if you don't get through the transition, you'll never get there, no matter how good those large plant economics are. But DOE really needed to focus on how do you get through the transition. Of course, one way is policy, which means taxes, uh, incentives like they have for hybrid cars now. Uh, but it, the, uh, the, through a transition, when you do not have a lot of vehicles on the market, and, you do, and so nobody, Exxon Mobil, is not going to build a big hydrogen plant if they can't have enough vehicles to use the hydrogen. And so you need to have a system, and it can best be accomplished through distributed production to fueling site. So you build these little appliances, you actually put them in every filling station, and you make your hydrogen at site. So if I have a hydrogen vehicle, I can, might have to measure how many hydrogen how many sites and where they are, but you could actually have it made right at the filling station. You could use natural gas reforming electrolysis, and while natural gas, as I said, in the long term would not be a viable solution, in the short term is probably the right solution to get you through the transition. Uh, wind and solar energy can provide the electricity to make some on-site hydrogen at a cost penalty, probably have to be subsidized. The structure of a mature hydrogen economy is difficult to imagine, let it evolve. If this is not a straightforward replacement for gasoline, you're not going to go in and plug in a hydrogen economy to replace a gasoline economy. And people spend a lot of time trying to imagine what it's going to look like. And somewhat's a waste of time, in our committee's view, because uh, you actually don't even know what the technology is going to be. And so you got to be careful. So let it evolve and worry about the transition. And since this study, the DOE has tripled their money they're spending on worrying about transitional issues. Uh, this allows time for development of new technology breakthrough concepts for large-scale hydrogen production. It allows time for the market to develop and, uh, and for non-technical issues to be overcome. One last slide. Now, these are the rest of the recommendations. Uh, uh, that the DOE, these are specific DOE recommendations. The DOE needs to establish a systems analysis. There's a tendency in the DOE to look at uh, hydrogen production as one problem, the pipeline is another problem, the filling station is another problem, the vehicle is another problem. These are system problems. And they're trade offs in the systems. And uh, they, so they, they did not have a, any large company today has the largest system. Capability. So it established a system analysis capability. We felt production distribution storage, dispensing of hydrogen was probably underfunded. Since this study was done, actually the funding has doubled. But the earmarking is a mess. In fact, 70% of the hydrogen program is earmarked by things that our committee felt would not progress this at all. I mean, I testified uh, on this issue. Uh, that's very good. But, you know, there's a hydrogen in North Dakota. There's some hydrogen project that actually consumes quite a bit of money that will not advance us toward the hydrogen economy at all. And uh, it's a it's a massive issue. And everything is pork, and everybody talks about it. But in this particular, there's no. It's interesting. There is no earmarking in the fuel cell part of the program. It's all in the hydrogen production part. Because of the time scale, the shift some development areas toward more exploratory work. And as an example of that, of a DOE, you know, a GM wants to build hydrogen vehicles and put hydrogen on board because storage is a big problem on board in 10,000 pounds per square inch containers. 
And uh, you know, and I'm sure you know, I'm sure GM would not do this. I, I believe this. If this was not safe. But DOE was doing work on it. And DOE shouldn't be doing work on that kind of stuff. DOE should be spending their money on long-term research and other activities. So we actually named a number of areas. On the research focus, we thought the DOE should shift all their effort and about 100, this, I didn't tell you the size of this program. This is a $1.7 billion five-year program. It's a lot of money. And we felt the DOE should shift. The DOE had a lot of fuel cell activity, but there are a lot of fundamental things that are not understood about the basic science of fuel cells. So to come up with a new uh, permeable membrane, for example, a lot of it is very much trial and error. Basic science isn't understood. Basic I understand that how platinum works, the anode isn't understood. And so a lot of work should be shifted toward exploratory work. They should greatly increase the work on making hydrogen at site because they have no program like that at all. They should increase their emphasis in developing infrastructure. How are you going to pipeline this? Uh, you have large pipelines, small pipelines, what do leaks look like? How do you compress hydrogen? All those things are required for in, to put it in for infrastructure. Uh, uh, carbon sequestration because coal is the abundant resource. And so one way is to look at this, if you're going to make it with U.S. resources, and natural gas isn't an option, you have coal, nuclear, biomass, wind, and solar. If coal, which is the most abundant resource, which also uh, is most cost competitive, which generates a lot of CO2. If you can't capture the CO2 and bury it, you're not going to be able to use coal as a source of hydrogen. <coughs> so carbon sequestration is important. And then direct hydrogen production from bio and solar, without going into that, we basically made recommendations to shift away from their programs of making hydrogen by photovoltaic methods and look at making it with direct photo bio methods where you actually have, uh, you know, bio-engineered uh, molecules, which would actually be in water, or you would actually be able to completely uh, absorb solar energy and split water, uh, and also direct uh, 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 photochemical, photoelectrical methods. Uh, this has actually been done. They've actually shifted some work. Strengthen the hydrogen safety program and partner with a broader range of academic, industrial, and government organizations. And they've actually done this. Uh, there was an awful lot of work that was work being done at National Labs, and not very much of it actually is being done at universities and so forth. And they've actually, in the last several contracts they've let, there's been a lot more industrial money. So uh, that's it. I think that our whole committee felt that hydrogen is something that needs to be worked on and needs to be explored. It has potential. You asked me what I conclude from this. It has potential for reducing energy imports. It could have some impact on reducing carbon dioxide emissions, but the emphasis needs to be someplace else. The two major issues are developing a cost-effective durable fuel cell and developing the infrastructure for delivering the hydrogen. And the most important social political issue is the perceived and real issues around hydrogen safety, uh, which are probably not as bad as most people think, but they're bad enough that I don't want my wife going to our hydrogen car right now. Anyway, I'd be glad to answer any questions. I don't know. It's not too close to find my guest. Thank you.
Yes. Did you address the problem of hydrogen storage in vehicles? Yes, we did. I didn't have a lot of it in this talk. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, when I say the fuels, the whole, the whole, uh, the issue of storing hydrogen on board and getting enough hydrogen <coughs> on, a, on, a, on a weight capacity basis and a volume capacity basis is a massive problem. And uh, that's why GM and people have used, they're using cylinders because they've used things like, uh, we, we looked at the metal hydride technology. Uh, we looked at uh, the, the carbon nanotube technology. We looked at all these things to be in And all of them at the present state can only absorb half of the hydrogen required to go 300 miles, which is the range. And in the middle of the study, independent of this, the DOE actually had a large study there the conference and actually led, I think, $30 million of work on storage. So uh, storage is a very, on vehicle storage is a very, very significant. Uh, if you actually get the efficiency of the fuel cell where it's supposed to operate in a way about the same as the engine, right now they're much larger because uh, you just can't get enough energy density in there. It's a very important part of designing the car because you put all that extra weight in the car. It's like putting batteries in the car. Why not? Very important. Yes. Is it possible to do the electrolysis on board, or is there just not enough capacity? Because people are speculating when you do electrolysis of the water instead of carrying hydrogen, very explosive or so forth, to carry enough water to do the electrolysis on board and then go through the process. You might be able to hear the question, the question whether you can do electrolysis. About electrolysis, you know, the real the, uh, the uh, fuel cells are polymer or proton exchange membrane fuel cells. The new electrolysis systems are polymer or proton exchange membrane electrolysis systems. They run in reverse of the fuel cell. Now, one of the things we think will happen as fuel cells get cheaper and cheaper is the cost of electrolysis will go down tremendously. And that'll make it more competitive. We did not look at electrolysis on board. We looked at it at site in relatively small units. Uh, anytime you want to put one of these things on board, it becomes really difficult. You know, the oil industry, for uh, years, of trying to put reformers on board vehicles to reform gasoline. And uh, to get these systems small enough is really complicated. I think. The world would be happy if we get electrolysis units small enough and cheap enough we can put them in, just put them at the site and convert water. Your uh, assumptions where you have the optimal conditions of about one percent a year replacement, and you gave the examples of the hybrid and the front wheel drive. And even if you go back and think they've done combustion, replacing the steam engines, and those replace the animal power. In all those cases, though, you have an abundant ready supply of energy, you're simply improving technology because it, it gives you 